Hey multi-potentialites, I'm really excited today I've got a super special guest, Pam Slim. Uh, if you don't know who Pam is, she, <laughs> Pam writes the incredibly popular blog Escape from Cubicle Nation and she has a book by the same name. And she just came out with her second book, which we'll be talking about, Body of Work. Um, she is a coach, she leads retreats, she's a speaker. Um, she is, a, you're a black belt in mixed martial arts, is that right? Just got it, yep. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. And do you, you teach? I know you did at one point. I, yeah, I don't. I taught a capoeira for years when I did the Afro-Brazilian capoeira, but not, not mixed martial arts. I'm just a baby student. You know, black belt's like the very beginning of, <laughs> wow. you know, learning. Yeah. Cool. Um, so, yeah, welcome. Thanks so much for, uh, for being here at Putty Like. Well, thanks for having me, you know. I mean, there's a reason why I put you in my book because I'm totally excited about this book for multi-potentialites. Yeah, so am Let me I. Tell you. Yeah, I just finished reading it and um, this is a fabulous book for multi-potentialites. I'm going to be recommending it to everyone. Awesome. Um, <laughs> yeah, so um, the first question I wanted to ask is what is a body of work and you know why do you use that terminology as opposed to you know career or something like that? Yeah. Well, it's so fun knowing that I'm talking to people who I don't have to sell on the idea that we have many <laughs> different interests in our lives and we can be doing different activities. Um, I think, you know, as a longtime career coach, I've, I've worked for, always worked on the human side of business for a long time. You know, I worked inside companies for a long time, coaching people in their careers. And then the last eight years I've, at Escape from Cubicle Nation, I've helped people to start businesses. And the one thing that just started to um, kind of kept coming back to me is that, uh, first of all, there's we, we focus so much on the work mode, right? Are you an employee? Are you an entrepreneur? And there's very much the light and dark side of the force, right? Like working for somebody else, bad, and working for yourself, good. You know, the only way to be free is to have your own business. Right. And uh, because I work in the like the bowels of the reality of what it's like, I have no glamour, glamorous view about what it takes to start and run a business. I am so amazed every day by my clients and the courage that it takes to go out there and make things happen as an entrepreneur. And it's not always the best kind of work mode for everybody. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I think that's important is that as human beings, we grow and we change and we evolve over time, right? So based on what's going on in our lives, what our creative interests are, we can do many things throughout the course of our lives. So my premise is, is that the purpose of our life is to create a body of work that makes us feel very proud, that contributes things to the world that we feel are important to contribute. And what I hope is a testament and a love letter to multipotentialites is that it doesn't have to be all in one particular track. Yeah. You don't have to just be an author and do the next book and the next book and the next book. You can be an author and then you can start a nonprofit and then you can have a cool you know, a volunteer project. That's, that's what life is about and that's what it means to be a full contact, full color human being in today's world, I think. Yeah, I love that because when you think of career, you think of this linear trajectory, you know, this like very vertical path. And I've always found that multi-potentialites in particular tend to like swerve between paths and, you know, and zigzag about. Um, and calling something a body of work takes away this pressure to just like have one thing that you're striving for. You can, you can still accomplish a lot and you can have this diversity and this variety. Exactly. It's about the work. It's about what you're creating. It's not about the mode that you do in which you do your work or what your particular career is. Because, you know, there are people who are wired to naturally be multipotentialites who always will be. And then there's also a whole bunch of other people in today's world of work uh, who would actually rather stay in one singular career track, mm -hmm. but because conditions are changing, they find they need to be able to do other things as well. So it's really, you guys are just ahead of the curve. Right, right. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm getting ready to do this big talk to parents, parents of multi-potentialites. Oh, cool. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's like the biggest thing I've ever done. I'm pretty excited. Um, and also afraid. Your, your chapter on fear helped me out of it. But... Yeah. <laughs> um, but one of the points I'm, I'm, I want to make is that being a multi-potentialite is a good thing for the way that things are moving in the economy. And, you know, it's going to be really important to be flexible and to be able to kind of take what's thrown at you and to shift gears and to move around. Um, would you agree with that? 
I would totally agree with that. You know, what's so interesting is right now, one of the big projects I'm working on is with the author Susan Cain, who wrote the book Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Won't Stop Talking. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that we find a lot within the introvert, extrovert, you know, uh, conversation that Susan is so passionate about is there has been an extrovert ideal, right? We say, hey, you know, speak up more in class, participate mm-hmm. more, you know, why aren't you more like your sister? She's always really friendly and she, you know, she doesn't want to go hide in the room with her book. What's wrong with you? Yeah. The same thing is true that we do where we have a singular career track bias, you know, ideal in which often we really reward socially and otherwise people who pursue what seems to be a great linear career path. And, it, you know, I, I like to always reinforce it's not by any evil plot by people or your parents or your grandparents that may be really trying to give you good advice mm-hmm. because they want you to be safe and happy and healthy, mm-hmm. you know. But I can think as a parent myself, if your kid is one day interested in the NFL and then it's, you know, in coyotes and then they do this and they want to do that, sometimes as parents, if you aren't aware that actually there are some kids that are wired as multipotentialites, mm-hmm. you might try to steer them to say, well, you know, don't focus on that and maybe you really want to get in here and you really should focus. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's a nuanced thing that I think only people who under- really understand multipotentialites or like in Susan's case, who really can understand introverts, can help parents really understand how to actually recognize what is behavior that's just somebody maybe kind of giving up on something because they're frustrated and they don't want to learn mm-hmm. versus somebody who might be more naturally wired for that. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm so excited that you're doing that. And that's a critical part of really the you know revolution that we want to have in terms of recognizing the diversity in ways that people are wired that you know that's in addition to the other kinds of diversity that that we have in the world. Do you have any specific advice for parents who might be raising multipotentialite children? You know I think the main thing um, as a parent is to always um, take the approach my (laughs) my eight-year-old son You would be so proud, okay? (laughs) He said, Mom, um, first I want to uh, win contests for video games so I can win, you know, because you can win like hundreds of thousands of dollars in Call of Duty or something. He said, then I want to work for Allstate. (laughs) Then when my dad retires, I want to take over his construction business. And uh, and then now he says he wants to be in the NFL, okay? (laughs) So uh, he plays flag football. He loves it. Um, and instead of saying maybe naturally as a parent, like, uh, you know what, honey, like that's probably not too realistic. You know, what I do instead is just try to express really intense interest in whatever it is that he's doing. So tell me about it. Like, what do you know for, there was a while where he was sure that he was going to be a product manager at Mojang, which is the company that makes Minecraft. And so we started to have this discussion about, you know, he's like, so what do they look for? And, you know, we talked about a product manager is always interested in new ideas for products and so forth. So what I try to do instead of steering him or judging or or saying, oh, that doesn't really make sense, to really just help understand what is it about it that he is interested in and notice there's a natural time frame. You know, there's certain things that I notice he does have a consistent passion for over time. And those are things I want to keep in mind, you know, to reinforce. But my job, as I see it as a parent, is to be recognizing and understanding what his natural inclinations are and helping him to explore ideas because who knows, like maybe he will be the first Navajo player in the NFL and I'll be totally wrong and <laughs> eating my words if I say it's not realistic, right? Yeah, oh, that's amazing. Um, yeah, yeah it's, it's sort of like you're helping him figure out his, his why or whys, you know, like, yeah. like what's pulling him towards things, which is so important because yeah. that is, that helps you kind of create or like understand the thread between your various pursuits if you understand yeah. like, what is drawing you to them. Yeah, um, exactly. Cool. So I want to read a quote from your book because I actually, you talk about multipotentialites in the section on modes, but you yeah. also, when I was reading the chapter on ingredients, I maybe it's just because I look at the world through this lens, <laughs> but I was like, ooh, multipotentialite, multipotentialite. Um, <laughs> so this is a quote by, um, is it David Batstone? Yes. It? Yeah. So um, for 25 years, I had a very bifurcated or tripolar existence. Uh, I had academic skills. I was an investor. Working for a bank, I was a journalist, and I had human rights impulses to help the poor. My worlds were very separate until Not For Sale, which is his uh, human trafficking, well, an organization to stop human trafficking. Mm -hmm. Um, I lived a siloed existence, he said. 
When we have so many divergent interests, people often think we are unfocused, therefore ineffective. They buy into the specialty mode ethos, where you are only valued if you have a deep expertise in one area. I never saw my multiple interests as a problem. I saw the threads in my story. It was a natural, logical quilt. Not for sale was the first time I could bring all of my worlds together. University professor, journalist, investor, and human rights activist. So I call that, yes. it's so good. <laughs> um, I call that uh, a group hug project because it started like Aww. a group hug of your many interests. Um, what, do you have any advice to help people kind of bring together their various interests, kind of you know, put them all into one project that will allow them to express all those different sides of themselves? Or? You know, what I think is interesting, and, and I love the inter the interview with David Batstone. I mean, that's one of my favorite stories in, in the whole book. And it what was so trippy about it, too, is the way he described it is he saw the threads that was a quilt, and he didn't even realize that the subtitle of my book is Finding the Threads That Tie Your Story Together. Yeah. So it was like, boom, boom. <laughs> um, but it, it, philosophically, sometimes they come together in the way that he described, where he was able to find a project that was... Uh, that allowed him to use all of his skills. Uh, the story in the book is he was actually sitting in a restaurant in San Francisco, his favorite Indian restaurant, mm -hmm. and he learned through a terrible news story that the owners of the restaurant were actually slave traffickers, and the people who were the busboys and the waiters and waitresses in the restaurant were were slaves. And it just totally blew his mind in that way, like his work actually came to him. And he became so overwhelmed by that reality that he took off to visit every continent and to understand what was the state of modern human slavery, of which it's horrific. I mean, there's more slave trade actively today than there ever was during the transatlantic slave trade, which just totally blew my mind. Um, so that's a case where he wasn't, he, wasn't lo he wasn't ingredients looking for a recipe. A recipe ended up showing up at his door. Yeah. And that's something I think that's really important, especially for multipotentialites is one thing is just having an awareness about what your ingredients are. So what are these different kinds of skills and strengths that you have? And how can you look uh, for, you know, in a finite period of time, what can be projects in which you can use a mixture of ingredients that is really interesting to you, right? Mm -hmm. So you might, uh, you know, have a background and experience in being a graphic designer and you haven't done that in a while because you've been doing something else in your work and then you grew up and, and you were an army brat and so you know you have this understanding about the military that you know you you would love to kind of be able to share because that's part of your experience and you know some other random ingredient and it really does become about looking at what is a significant project that's relevant for you in the moment that's of interest mm -hmm. and that is something that you do feel would be really worth your time so that you can add it to your body of work and that's the part to me that feels kind of liberating about that metaphor for body of work is uh, you know any artist can tell you like you have great stuff and you have some things where you're like wow I'm kind of <laughs> that was an interesting experiment yeah. you know um, but the key is, is that you're, you're always creating and you're doing, you know, you're doing individual projects mm -hmm. and you can be just thinking about, sometimes we have the view, I think it's a little bit of the old school way that we look at careers where the key is to use all of your ingredients in one. I love your metaphoric group hug. I'm totally going to uh, take <laughs> sure. that from now on with attribution to you. That's a beautiful way of looking at it. But we don't have to use all our ingredients mm -hmm. in all of our projects all the time. Yeah. And sometimes it's actually really, you know, really fun to leave something behind for a while and then come back and pick it up. You know, I had for 10 years, I was a consultant to corporations. I did tons of work with companies and I actually really liked it. I like, I, I, I like the sales process. I like working with people and everything. I've been in startup mode for the last eight years. I used to do a lot of training design and development, you know, now I've been in startup world and all of a sudden like my worlds are coming together where mm -hmm. I'm starting to do webinars like for a large company, I'm doing work with Citrix, you know, about training and development that's for a market that includes entrepreneurs and corporate mm -hmm. folks. And because I haven't touched that stuff in eight years, all of a sudden it feels like fresh and light yeah. and fun again. Yeah. Whereas when I stopped doing that and I got into startup work because I was just really tired of being in that environment and I wanted something new. Mm -hmm. So it's like, um, it's like having, uh, you know, your set of clothes where you can always like dust things off and add a new belt and, you know, yeah. <laughs> kind of mix and match in new ways. But you don't have to always be using all your ingredients at the same time. Yeah. 
if you can, it can feel fantastic, but that's not really the main point. The point is that you're creating things that are highly enjoyable, that are engaging, and that give you the kind of financial return, you know, that you need at that point in your life. Mm -hmm. I found that too. I found that I have certain interests that come back around that I like let go for many, many years. Like yeah. music is a big one that I was, I was, you know, it, my whole world was about music when I was younger and that I just burnt out and I was just like, I need to do other things. And so for 10 years, I didn't really play much music. And then recently I started playing the violin again and I picked up the guitar again and I recorded an album last year with my friend. And um, so, awesome. yeah. Um, so let's talk about when to quit something because you have, you talk about the loathing scale. Yeah. Um, and I have a similar idea, which is the idea of boredom, which is something I think a lot of multi-potentialites experience after they've mm. been doing something for a while. They kind of yeah. hit this end point for themselves and they start to get bored. And I, I think that, you know, there's resistance and that's mm. different. I think it feels different in your body. Yeah. Um, but boredom, I think, is kind of like your body's way of telling you that it's time to change directions and do something yeah. fresh. Um, can you talk a bit about, about your loathing scale? Because I really like that. Yeah, it's definitely a fine line, and it's like where we actually need to learn a new language, which is how our body actually talks to us about what, what we're supposed to do. I mean, it's, it, is, it is very uh, nuanced sometimes. The loathing scale is something that I came up with when I was working with clients, and in particular in the situation where people were deciding, I'd be trying to evaluate uh, what the timing was for when they wanted to make the leap in the case of Escape from Cubicle Nation, right? So there, so I'd say, you know, you imagine that one on the loathing scale is everything's great, you love your job, it's cool. <laughs> Ten is, is that you feel physically ill even thinking about going into your workplace. Mm -hmm. And so when you get in the seven to ten range, where it's like really negative, you really don't like what you're doing, and that can manifest, like you said, either in real loathing, like really not wanting to go, or just having no feeling at all, just being emotionally disconnected and kind of bored. Mm -hmm. That generally is not really the best time to be making determinations about moving on to something else. I mean, we're all that said, we're all motivated by different things. So some for some people, actually myself included, I often only make a change when I get really high on the loathing scale or when the pain becomes really big and then I'll, you know, I'll make a change. But what you want to start to pay attention to is when every, you know, every work engagement, uh, every project has a natural life cycle. See if you can get some check-in points where you can, you know, you do the first phase. So that could be anywhere from, you know, three months to a year. And you set it up saying, I'm, I'm willing to experiment to be doing this. And then let me, let me put in a checkpoint and see how I feel, right? As long as you're still excited and engaged in the work and you're lower on the loathing scale, then you can say, all right, I'm really willing to take the next step. But sometimes what's a danger zone I find is that people get super high, get in the 9 to 10 range in the loathing scale, then they just want to, you know, crash and burn, burn bridges, quit with having no plan or no safety net, sometimes make dubious choices about just jumping to something because it sounds better. Mm -hmm. And that's not really the best, you know, kind of frame of mind to, to, to notice. So the way that the loathing scale speaks to you is through your body. And there's a, a cool little tool I actually talked about in Escape from Cubicle Nation that I learned from Martha Beck, which is to, she calls it your body compass. First, you think about a time where you were totally like miserable, something really negative happened to you in your life, personally or professionally. Close your eyes, imagine that horrible situation, and then notice how it feels in your body. For some people, their, their shoulders clench or their gut clenches, you get a headache, whatever. Mm -hmm. So write down what those physical symptoms are. Then do the same thing with a really positive experience and note physically what was going on. Then when you're having, when you're going through your day, you can begin to tune into actually what's happening with your physical symptoms because our brain often overrides something. Like, why aren't I happy? I'm making all this money. I'm doing, I'm living my dream. Why am I not satisfied? Your, your essential self, your truth inside you is really always going to be speaking through your body. So it's the kind of thing that you just start to pay attention to and then pretty soon you just know it. That that's where you start to really trust your gut because you notice the kind of signals um, you know, that, that your body is giving you. Hmm. Um, and so would you, do you recommend having a side hustle to kind of get out of a situation that you, I mean you talk about how everyone should have a side hustle which I love. Um, I think multi-potentialites often have several side hustles. <laughs> right. Sometimes it's a matter of reining in your right. side hustles. Right. right, right. 
You know, um, I, I'm always reticent, you know, being a coach to say everybody should do anything right. because, you know, whatever works for you. But it is it is good, especially in, in kind of an insecure, you know, economy and work environment. It, it's a great way to be testing things to, to work on something on the side. Mm -hmm. So in the case of business ideas, I never really trust anything until somebody is able to take the idea and translate it into something real where a real thing is shipped and a real person who's not your close relative pays money for it and you actually you know make a sale that's where you can really see if something actually has viability so there's one side to it that becomes a risk mitigation where if you're trying something it gives you a chance to experiment while still having the stability of you know getting a salary or you know even if you work for yourself and you're trying something new it's kind of like uh, informational interviews in, in, in a regular career thing just talk to people who are doing things you want to do um, but then the other thing is it often when people have a side hustle set up, I talk about this sometimes with people that are employees, in a worst case scenario where you don't, you're unprepared, you know, a new merger comes or something happens where you're laid off unexpectedly, often what you do when you have a side hustle is you set everything up from an infrastructure perspective to be able to get money. So you get your PayPal account, maybe you get your little business license and your business account and all these things in place so that if you do need to activate another way of making a living, everything is there and it's ready for you. And I, I very unfortunately it was sometimes on the other side of the table when you know I was with an HR team, we were going through layoffs and it, I can't tell you how horrible it is to look at the face of somebody who was unprepared mm -hmm. to know that they were losing their job and to realize maybe because they were trying to be loyal to the company and never doing anything else mm -hmm. that they had no idea what they were going to do next mm -hmm. and I never want anybody to be in that situation even if they decide that they don't want to have a permanent side hustle mm -hmm. you at least want to know how could I take care of myself and or my family if, mm -hmm. you know, if I lose my employment or my business goes under or something like that? Yeah. And not just loyal to their company, but also loyal to this, this ideal of, of just, just doing one thing, you know, just the, the singular yeah. career that, like, um, I think is really romanticized in our culture. You know, it's like the one true yeah. calling. Um, right, right. Like the one to, you know, your true love, the one true person. Right, you know? And right. sometimes people, sometimes people find that, you know, I profiled my dad in the book, mm -hmm. uh, who has been a huge influence on me. And he did, does have a, a true passion, which is photography. He's been a photographer for over 50 years. He's 79 years old. He's still taking photographs and still loves it as much today as he does, you know, and the thing that I think is really cute is he still gets totally nervous. <laughs> I mean, he, he may not like that I call it cute, but you know, he'll send me an email. You know, I just sent in this project to a client. You know, I hope they, I haven't heard back from him. I hope they like it. You know, and I've never heard of anybody ever telling him they didn't like his photographs. He's an award-winning photographer, but he takes it seriously and he loves it. At the same time, I think he's been a multi-potentialite in always being somebody that had community projects that was a huge mm -hmm. part of what he did. And the story I tell in the book is about a, a hundred year old school that's in his community that for the last 25 plus years, he and my bonus mom and other people in the community have been slowly restoring back to its original state. Just because. He's like, you know what, because yeah. it, it's, it's meant to be an institution of learning. And that's something I see. He's 79. He retired at 65, but he's continued to work always and to do projects, do freelance photography, and do his, uh, you know, his community work. I mean, I can't imagine him ever not being excited by what he's doing. You know, he doesn't hit that post-retirement slump where he has no meaning in his life. He's the kind of person that has so many ideas and is so excited about making change in the world that I know he'll be doing it up until his last breath, you know, and I hope that he continues on for, you know, as long as he possibly can. Yeah. But there's many ways I think that it, that it manifests, even for people that have a really strong passion for, you know, one particular thing. The other thing I just want to make clear is part of your body of work is also things that are not really work. It can be the quality of relationships that you have with your family, who you are as a parent, who you are as a community member. Um, I think about my aunts who have been very active publicly in AA, you know. Um, they, huge part of their body of work is being sponsors for people, you know, who, um, who are part of AA. And that's like something that they are so proud of that they spend a huge amount of their effort and energy doing, you know. So it doesn't have to just be um, components of your work that you create. I think there are intangibles that have a real imprint in the world. If you're walking through your day, 
being a kind, generous human being. I mean, that, that can change that can change a lot within your community. Mm-hmm. So it's sort of like what you put out there. Yeah, like, exactly. Across the course of your life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's talk briefly about fear. Um, you talk about surfing the fear as opposed to, you know, crushing the fear or something. Can you explain <laughs> what you mean by that? Yeah. You know, I, I really, I feel like I've uh, gotten a master's degree or almost a PhD in, in fear with, uh, I mean, sometimes my own life journey, my own experiences, training martial arts for a long time, working in early stage entrepreneurship, being an entrepreneur, being married to an entrepreneur. And uh, the one thing that really has helped me and shifted the work that I do is in recognizing that fear is really a protective force. When you look at the the function of our uh, primitive brain, our, our lizard brain, it is to always be blasting signals of lack or attack. So there's not enough food and somebody's going to come get you, right? The reason why that's been programmed into us and why we have so far been successful as a human species, unfortunately destroying much of the other species around us, is, uh, is because uh, it is a protective force so that we always are pay attention to make sure that we have our next meal and that we're aware of things around us so that we don't get harmed or injured. So looking at fear that way, um, to me, is very helpful. So then you can say, okay, so I'm laying awake at 3 in the morning. I'm having a panic attack because I may not have enough money to pay my rent this month. So why am I scared? What am I scared of? And you begin to enter into dialogue, again, with this force that you consider to be a benevolent force that is there to protect you. Mm -hmm. And that's often where you can discover, well, I'm totally nervous because I don't have any clients. Well, why don't you have any clients? Because... I'm totally uncomfortable picking up the phone and talking to people, or I don't know what to sell, or I feel really alone. And so when you begin to uncover what's underneath the fear, then you can actually do something about it. And, and usually if you ask enough questions, and if, if you feel weird talking to yourself, <laughs> you, can, you can engage somebody else to ask the questions with you. Mm-hmm. And then that's where you can start to lay things out where there is something that can be a problem that's willing to be solved. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, as a creative person, uh, I'm telling you, the, the journey of writing books and having children, actually, by the way, it was astounding. The power of the fear, of the doubt, of, you know, it was like, I can't even describe, like an Alfred Hitchcock movie or something. You know, I remember when I had my first uh, child and I had a natural childbirth. And I remember in the middle of it, because it's so intense and overwhelming, I was like, I can't believe that billions of women around the world for ever since the beginning of time have gone through this experience and nobody really describes how amazingly powerful and overwhelming it is. You know, it was astounding and beautiful, but also terrifying, Mm -hmm. right? That whole experience. And then the same thing is true, I think, you know, in, in writing a book is it, it when you are bringing something to life and you are doing some kind of creative endeavor, you know, fear, doubt, anxiety, all that is just totally part of it. And I had a, a dear friend of mine, Michael Bungay Stanier, who is at Box of Crayons, who is just a good friend of mine that took pity on me, you know, knowing I was stressing about my book a little bit. And one day I had been like surfing on Facebook for like eight hours and like not doing anything and I was totally stressed out. I, I love that description. Those few pages, I was like, I can relate to this. <laughs> So. Totally. It was like I was literally trans, you know, translating what, what I do when I spiral down. But I said, you know, I just feel like, I, I, you know, I'm not Dan Pink. I don't have this carefully, you know, researched approach. I'm not this disciplined Stephen Pressfield. And, and, he, and he, he's like, what if like that just is the creative process? What if sometimes like spinning into this crazy land in your head is part of, of the whole creative process? And that really shifted something with, within me mm-hmm. because uh, I had told myself the story that great writers, uh, you know, just sit down and mm-hmm. write really good things. And you know, I've read enough books about writing to know that sometimes it doesn't all feel good. But I was heaping on a whole bunch of shame on myself mm-hmm. for some of the feelings I had that were kind of intense where I didn't know what I was writing about. I didn't know if I could meet my book deadline. I didn't know if the idea, you know, held any water. And I talk to a lot of authors in, in the work that I do, and I find that more often than not, everybody feels that way. And it's like this big myth and crazy PR stunt that, like, 
people are just really cool and they act like it's just really easy to write a book or you, whatever your, your creative endeavor is. It's actually really reassuring to hear for me because I'm writing a book right now and I've kind of I've kind of put it on hold a little bit because I've been preparing for this big talk, but also I've been feeling like a lot of shame about just not knowing where it's going and, and I know I need to get back to it and so that, that's good to hear. <laughs> yeah, it's just like whatever it is, just engage with it. You know, that's what Michael was saying, like celebrate the craziness of it and, and, and sometimes that's, that's part of what ends up being inside the book. You know, yeah. when, when I wrote my first book is right when the economy was totally crashing and and my daughter was tiny and my husband's business was totally crashing and I'm sitting there like uh, the metaphor I thought of uh, was that I'm sitting under this palm tree in jungle warfare like, trying to write this poem because it was so crazy what was going on financially around me and I was writing this book about quitting your stable job to start a business right. and it was just like what the hell am I doing <laughs> and my dad actually told me he said this will make you write a better book and that's one of the actually the guiding principles that I had in Escape from Cubicle Nation is I'm not going to be fairy dust and just dream it and believe it and take the leap and the net will appear. And I'm like, I am not going there. I'm going to include stories of the hard part. I'm going to include a lot of very specific information, some which might borderline scare people when they realize how much stuff is required to start a business because I want people to really understand, you know, what's involved. It's totally worth it if you want to do it. But um, that is part of our creative process. It just, it just is. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, um, so I want to thank you again for writing this book and for you know just talking about multipotentialites and using that word because I think it's really important for people to understand what that means. Even if they're not a multipotentialite themselves, they'll be interacting with them and working with them. And I hear yes. from so many people who just like find my website and are like, whoa, there's a name for this? I thought I was, I thought there was something wrong with me. And so if you can yes. give it a name and just get it out there, um, it, it really makes a big difference. And so thank you so much for putting us in there. Well, thank you. I'm so proud of your body of work and I'm glad that you have taken up that flag and you're really willing to, you know, to move it forward because it is necessary. You know, it is really about all of us feeling good about how it is that we're wired. We are created how we are for a reason. Right. And mm -hmm. so if you're always getting messages that are thrown at you telling you that there's something wrong with you and you're broken and you need to be fixed, yeah. it is not surprising that it might create some, you know, some personal and creative stress. So I'm, I'm so excited and I, I hope that more people check out the work that you're doing. I mean, that would be Thank a great you. side benefit of, of my book and <laughs> getting out there in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Um, cool. Is there anything else you'd like to say to uh, community of multi-potentialites before we head off? You know, I think um, <clears throat> our mutual friend Abe Cahuto, mm -hmm. who I think that's how I first um, learned about you is through Abe, you know, we were having this whole discussion about finding the thread that ties your story together, right? You know, Abe's totally created multi-potentialite, you know, is, has talent in so many different areas. And uh, he was saying, you know, where can I find my like E equals MC squared, you know, way of describing myself in a way that makes sense to people. Um, I see this as a journey that all of us are going to be on. I know for me, a lot of times when I write a book, sometimes it's just asking the right questions and creating a framework to which I know I don't have all the answers. And, uh, you know, the way I think that we're going to understand to kind of create context and be able to describe what it is that we're doing um, in a way that makes sense to other people besides the community of multi-potentialites mm -hmm. where you can kind of, you know, be sympathetic with each other. Yeah is by sharing the stories and is by finding and sharing creative ways in which you do demonstrate projects like the group hug. You know, I, I love that we can get David Batstone's story out there um, as a demonstration for people about sometimes how powerful it is to be having different interests and to be bringing them together for a very significant project. But I guess, in, you know, as opposed to advice, I'm also looking for advice for examples, for insights from your own community as you find people who are able to describe, you know, cool ways that you can be talking about the work that you do, ways that you can um, even showcase your work. So maybe you've done a whole bunch of different things. I think we're going to see a whole slew of websites and software tools and apps where we can have better ways that we can tell our story. So if you hear of them and you have great examples or you get your E equals MC squared moment, um, please share them with me. You know, I'm at Pam at PamelaSlim.com 
And uh, I would just really love to hear the stories because that's part of what I consider my own body of work within the next couple of years as I'm talking about this book is being able to showcase different examples. Mm -hmm. And then if all of us can lean in to help Abe get his E equals MC <laughs> squared, I'm going to be happy because I can't rest until he gets the answer that he needs. I know. And I, I, I think you're amazing for working on him so hard. <laughs> I, I can't wait also. The poor guy. I just, I feel for him because I won't leave him alone. I stalk him on Facebook. That's awesome. But, you know, I love and adore him so yeah. much. And, uh, you know, I, it, it just, uh, I think it's going to feel really good for him to be able to describe it in a way that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so where can people find you? Is, is it just PamelaSlim.com or? Yeah. So um, you can find the book at PamelaSlim.com slash body of work. And, uh, that's where, for anybody that's getting it before December 31st, you can get some cool pre-order goodies. And then after December 31st, when it goes live, that's where there'll be information about the book. Um, I'm always at escapefromcubiclenation.com is where most of my blog posts and information is. Um, as I'm working on the launch, I'm that classic multi-potentialite brand transition. So eventually, PamelaSlim.com will be much more robust. But right now, most of my world lives on Escape from Cubicle Nation. And then for the book, we've had the designated spot at uh, PamelaSlim.com slash body of work. Cool. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. Um, it was a pleasure speaking with you and getting to read your book. Um, and I really, I can't wait for this to get out there. Uh, Yay! Really I can't it. wait too. I can't wait for the multi-potentialite community <laughs> to, uh, to get it and tell me what you think about it. I'm hoping you find it a love letter to all of you. Yeah, I certainly <laughs> did. Um, it, was, it was such a pleasure to read. So Awesome. Yeah.